Star Wars opened in the USA on May 27, 1977. It was shot anamorphic 35mm, but 70mm blow-ups were screened in eight of the premiere cinemas. Such was a success that more 70mm prints were struck and distributed from July and throughout the rest of the year, actually replacing 35mm prints being screened in some of the venues up to that time. Star Wars proved to be a revolution for the film industry, which at the time some viewed as being in terminal decline. It not only saved many cinemas, but it also went on to change how films were made. In 1977 we still enjoyed cinemas with huge screens. As an example, the Edwards Newport Cinema in California boasted a screen that was 75 feet wide by 35 feet high, and that is exactly how Star Wars needs to be seen. As a result of watching this 4K UHD release of Star Wars recently, it confirmed to me it's just not the same to see this film on our tiny home screens, or even in a modern multiplex. The definition on this disc is so good that it looks somehow lost, and can have an artificial set light look that the film never had previously. It really could do with a huge screen to get the best out of it, and return the realism to the near perfect picture. Unfortunately, it's the reworked version of Star Wars, and I struggle with parts of it owing to the sometimes obvious animation added into the picture. The high dynamic range is too bright in places, and so I had to turn it down a little, but most of the disc seems best with HDR on full, so you'll just have to see how it looks on your system. The fabulous film history website in 70mm.com has a nice page with photos and information by Derek Young, showing early London West End cinemas when Star Wars opened. The UK premiere was 27th of December 1977, seven months after that of the USA premiere. It opened in two cinemas, the Leicester Square Theatre and the Dominion Theatre on Tottenham Court Road. At the end of the following month, on January 29th 1978, the film was released to 12 more cities around the UK. It was some months later by the time my local cinema had Star Wars playing, and by then all manner of Star Wars collectibles and promotions had been made available. As a child the film seemed to be coming for ages, and the anticipation to see it seemed to make it even more exciting. But because of the delay to the UK release, some of us had a bit of an advantage, because Ken Films had made a 200 foot selected scenes release available on Super 8. My brother and I had the black and white silent version of this reel, but we did manage to get a recording of the soundtrack, which we sometimes even managed to keep in sync. I suppose to understand the novelty or excitement of having this reel requires the understanding of this being a time when the only alternative to occasional Super 8 home movie shows was television broadcasts, and you had to wait four or five years to see a film again after it had been in the cinema. Further Star Wars releases followed from Ken Films, and then in 1987 or 1988, Duran Film stunned us all by getting the rights from Fox and issuing the film as a scope full-length feature. It's not the best Super 8 print ever struck, but to be able to project this historic film as big as you could in your own home was a dream come true for many of us. Despite not being the best quality ever available, today it is probably the best representation of that historic original version of the film for home viewing, and that is why these prints are so sought after, and so valuable. I went to see Star Wars twice at the cinema in 1978, but if I'd have been older and known what was available at the time, I'd have taken a trip into London to see it at the Odeon Marble Arch, where they were screening the film in a wonderful curved screen format, known as Dimension 150, or D150, which had first been developed from 1957 to 1963. This was a special 70mm print of Star Wars, with a curve optically printed into it, and projected onto the huge screen that was curved 120 degrees. This is the famous film frame poster by Grant Lobben, which Ernie Marsh snapped for me to illustrate the D150 frame. What a shame we still don't enjoy films the same way today, but Star Wars, sadly, was to be the last film ever shown in D150 at Marble Arch. The 70mm D150 print was certainly special, but the 35mm general release prints were shipped over from America 
after they'd finished their theatrical run there, thereby saving a lot of money on striking identical prints for the two major film guy markets who just happen to speak the same language. That may go some way to explaining the US and UK staggered release dates. All the prints were checked and some reels were considered to have excessive damage and were therefore discarded and explains why some prints were made up of reels from two or three different prints. It seems inconceivable today that a film could remain in cinemas for over a year, but that was the case with Star Wars in the pre-home video, pre-internet days. Going to the cinema was still something special, and for many of us, Star Wars was something special too. It became the highest grossing film at the worldwide box office up to that time, but in terms of audience numbers, Gone with the Wind was still some way out in front. The two sequels, The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, were also hugely popular, but after 1983, that appeared to be it, and we would never get any more Star Wars films. Before the big re-release in 1997 under the special edition banner, anything Star Wars related seemed like a potentially historic collectible for the future. One such item was the release of the Star Wars adaptation for radio in 13 parts. I had listened to this when it was first broadcast in 1981, but then in 1993 the Lucasfilm fan club magazine detailed the release of this on both audio cassette and CD. But because it wasn't to be available outside of America, I had to order it in a bookshop when I was in the USA early in 1994. The Empire Strikes Back radio play followed a year or two later. Return of the Jedi wasn't done, but Highbridge Audio, who issued the first two on tape and CD, produced the play and issued it themselves, so at least we had the whole set in the end. Interestingly, Return of the Jedi is only six parts, which I think tells us something about the lack of story to the third film. The Empire Strikes Back is ten parts. All three of the films ended up having full-length scope Super 8 releases, but Ken Films had issued Empire as a 2x400-foot cutdown. They were expecting to make this a 3x400-foot, but the home video market had started to grow up around this time, and Super 8 started to take the hit. Hence why the second part of the 2x400-foot, which came out sometime after the first 400-foot reel, is a little rushed and not a patch on that first 400-foot. They did issue a 200-foot of the first part though, and this came with a sound on both the film stripe and a cassette for those without a sound projector. Good luck with keeping that in sync. In 1982, Star Wars was issued on LaserVision disc, but it was panned and scanned so that less than half of the original image area was visible. This is probably unimaginable to younger people today, but that was the way it was. When the films eventually arrived on VHS, it was the same, but then owing to the growth of the widescreen laserdisc market, the same was attempted with VHS. VHS quality was rarely very good, but for most this was the first time they'd had the chance to see the films in roughly the correct format since they were first released to cinemas. But the best way to see the original Star Wars films on video in their original form was the THX laserdisc releases in the USA. I purchased the Empire Strikes Back THX Laserdisc simply to use it to re-record my feature-length Super 8 print to get the best possible sound to enhance the best image quality available for the home market at that time. That is why I ended up with the THX versions of the VHS tapes too. I may never have watched them, but I have heard the soundtracks. And then George Lucas announced that he would be working on special editions of the three films to re-release them to cinemas in 1997. It was a masterstroke, and it was to pave the way for his return to Star Wars filmmaking after the intervening years in which he concentrated on building up his Lucasfilm business. By this time, his special effects house, Industrial Light and Magic, was renowned as the best in the world, but it was their model work and the motion control camera developments for the Star Wars films that took them to the top. For the special editions, they will be using computer animation as well as shooting some new scenes, but it was fun to see Star Wars on a big screen again, and these are the Laserdisc releases of those special editions. I saw them on the 58 foot wide screen at the Odeon Marble Arch, but some of the animation did not match the special effects standards achieved in 1977. I enjoyed seeing the films at the cinema once more, but naively thought that the original films would return now that the special editions had generated interest in the forthcoming prequels. 
The original versions would sadly only appear as an extra on one of the DVD releases, and these versions used the original widescreen Laserdisc masters, so there was nothing new to see there. Interestingly, the special edition posters for both Empire and Jedi are double-sided, but the first film is only single-sided. I dare say there were variations on these, but for me, the best of the three posters is Return of the Jedi. But maybe when this video is finished, I'll put each of these posters up in the light box and we'll see how they look, because I do think they should look better than the Star Wars poster, as it's only single-sided. The prequel trilogy was issued in this rather special Blu-ray pack with these special edition versions of the first three films and it came with this film frame which is odd because it is not in the correct format. The Star Wars films issued on 35mm were in scope not widescreen and this is how the frame should look. It's a nice pack but these have been surpassed by the 4Ks and having looked at the 4K of Star Wars recently this is perceptibly sharper on the 4K than it is on the Blu-ray in the pack. You have to look into the distance shots to really see the distinct difference, so don't get fooled by close-ups where they may be all too similar. Disney spent a lot of money purchasing the rights to the Star Wars universe, and I saw The Force Awakens at the genuine IMAX in London Science Museum. That six-minute sequence in IMAX was worth the cost of admission on its own. I thought The Last Jedi had the best opening of any Star Wars film, but after that initial 15 or 20 minutes, I didn't really like it much. I think the Luke Skywalker character was completely wrong, and he just wouldn't have behaved the way he did in this film. J.J. Abrams was brought back to rescue the situation that had been left after The Last Jedi, and any film with Babu Frick in it was a film I was going to like. But it did take two viewings on consecutive evenings to realise I did really like it. Babu Frick... Well, he still makes me laugh every time I think about him. We took a trip to the BFI IMAX to see a blow-up print of Rogue One, but by then anything on an IMAX screen was being passed off as IMAX. Clearly it wasn't IMAX, but it was good to see it on the 90-foot wide screen. Reproductions of Peter Cushing and Carrie Fisher were a little too obviously animated, but apart from that I thought it was a lot of fun. I also enjoyed Solo, so overall my opinion is that the Disney releases have been better than the prequel trilogy, which I'm sure not everyone will agree with. Talking of IMAX, there was a genuine IMAX documentary titled Special Effects that I saw at the Bradford IMAX, and this is an experiment I shot with Super 8 with a scope lens on it. Not entirely successful, but this is the window at the front of the Bradford IMAX with the Star Wars display. Within this film they reproduce the spectacular opening of Star Wars, and it certainly was a sight to behold. So if this IMAX 1570 print is ever screening at a genuine IMAX cinema anywhere near you, then that Star Wars reproduction sequence shot at ILM using the original models should be something that you'll never forget. So, to return to the original Star Wars, albeit in a special edition form, was part of a long history I've had with a film I've loved since 1978. I can fully understand why George Lucas wanted to go back and finish his film, and with some exceptions, I think it was an excellent job. I don't like the sequence with the animated moving dewbacks, nor the entry into Mos Eisley Spaceport, but apart from these new animated sequences, I was very much enjoying seeing Star Wars in such clarity on our home screen. The Jabba the Hutt sequence rather spoils all that though, and I find it hard to get back into the film after that. However, it's possible I actually prefer the final battle around the Death Star to that of the original version. Having said that, to create what they did in 1977 is so historic that we should really be looking at that and appreciating the context of it being created in 1976 and 1977. Fortunately, I can still see that piece of cinematic history on my Super 8 feature print. And before anyone tells me, I do know a group of enthusiasts have created a 4K of the original film using surviving, unfaded film prints. Let's hope that one day Lucasfilm and Disney give their approval to that work so we can all appreciate it. If you're sitting on the fence about this 4K of Star Wars, it is of the highest 35mm quality, although you will notice occasional scenes where the original negative was too far gone, and so a dye transfer Technicolor print that George Lucas had kept has been used. 
At least this work was undertaken in time for the 1997 re-release, which meant that most of the negative could be used and a duplicate struck on low-fade negative stock for the future. Sadly, the original version of the film has not been made available, but much of that original film can still be seen in this version, and it is fabulous to look at, albeit with noticeable image degradation on both original special effects sequences using green screen and some of the newer computer animation scenes, such as when Han Solo meets Jabba the Hutt. But other than these minor criticisms, there is very good colour and contrast. The aspect ratio is of course 2.40 to 1 and the sound is now Dolby Atmos. It has been reworked here and there, which may not be something that everyone will like, but perhaps it does fit in with a more ambitious format of this version. You need to see this film on the biggest screen possible, and as I said earlier, the HDR is variable and a little over bright in places, most notably the early scenes inside the Rebel Blockade Runner, where everything is white. I'm surprised by the almost complete absence of film grain, which suggests image noise reduction has been applied quite liberally, but thankfully it hasn't generated the waxy look. It has caused the side effect of making the film to look a little more like video though, which isn't my preference. Basically some of the reality of Star Wars as it was has been lost, but I expect many will think it better with this more sterile look. The bonus disc has a couple of new items featuring set dresser Roger Christian, but I think everything else has been seen before. The quality of some of the older extra featurettes can best be described as variable, but they are all full of good information. Now before I go, I don't often show 16mm on this channel, don't really have much of it, but on this reel is the original 1976 teaser trailer for Star Wars, and it's interesting because this was done before all the sound and special effects were completed, and so we get to see things like the lightsabers with just their reflective material on them, and they don't really have quite the same impact as the animated ones we got to see with the opticals overlaid to that reflective material, so we got the blue and the red lightsabers and the uh, flashes of light all that sort of thing. The sound effects too, completely different soundtrack, and uh, there's a sequence in the cantina where the lightsaber's first used, and you can clearly tell the sound is completely different. I think a lot of people have actually seen this 76 trailer now, but it's a nice souvenir to have it on 16mm here, and I do actually have it on Super 8 as well. But 16mm is quite relevant at the moment because Second Sight Films have recently issued Dog Soldiers, which was shot on 16mm. Now, if we look at this, you can see there's only a sprocket down the one side, but some 16mm does come double sprocket with a sprocket on either side, and Dog Soldiers was done in a format called Super 16, whereby it actually fills the area between the sprockets and goes much further over, so you get bigger image area. Now, it's not going to compete with 35mm for the image area of that, which of course doesn't even compete to 70mm, but that is why Dog Soldiers looks better than you might have expected. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a like, and perhaps consider subscribing so I'll be encouraged to carry on creating content like this again in the future. Until the next video, bye-bye for now.